uh, guests, um, colleagues, students, uh, good evening. Um, I'm Edward Peck, I'm the Vice Chancellor, the Chief Executive of Nottingham Trent University, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here to, to our Newton Building this evening, the next event in our Business Leaders Lecture Series. And it is a great honour to introduce you this evening, not just to the Chair of the Football Association, but also the British Vice President of FIFA, Debbie Hewitt, MBE, following her appointment earlier this month. Uh, Debbie is the first female FIFA Vice President, and I suspect the first FIFA President in due course, in the history of the organisation. She'll serve a four-year term in the seat, which is reserved by the world governing body for a UK representative. So our congratulations, Debbie. Although perhaps you're now accustomed to making history. Uh, Debbie was the first woman to become chair of the Football Association when she was appointed in June 2021. Earlier in her career, Debbie was the first female managing director of the RAC. Now the RAC is actually the Royal Automobile Club. And much to my surprise, is it actually a club? It's like the Garrick Club, uh, one of those London clubs. When you go to this club, there's always a car in the foyer, uh, which they have a special lift to bring up from the back of the organisation. So the RAC is, in fact, a real club. The point of this is that she's the first woman chief executive in its 125-year history when she was appointed. So it comes as no surprise in 2021, she was included in the Vogue 25, British Vogue's annual list of the UK's most influential women. Uh, we are fortunate to be sharing her experiences, giving advice and answering questions later this evening. But just a bit more about uh, Debbie's career. Uh, her, her rise in business is quite remarkable, uh, and it's one that started right here in Nottinghamshire. And Debbie began her working life as a management trainee in her hometown of Newark's branch of Marks and Spencers. From there, she carved a successful career in retail before being given the chance to complete an MBA at Bath University. And having gone straight into work for Rutherford University, Debbie grabbed the opportunity to do her MBA, which she completed part-time between 1992 and 1995. She went on to head up commercial activities to the RAC, including its roadside recovery and auto windscreen strands, and earned promotion on the company's board aged just 32. In 2011, Debbie received an MBE for services to business and the public sector. And in the same year, she joined the board of the financial services company, the BGL Group, owner of the well-known comparison website, Compare the Market, famous for the best advertising campaign based on what must be one of the worst puns in history. <laughs> Debbie joined as an executive director, later become its non-executive chair. Oh, and by the by, she's also an executive chair of Visa Europe Limited, and fashion retailer White Stuff Limited. And Debbie's previous non exec chair roles include private equity owned Evander Group and HPI Limited, and listed businesses the Restaurant Group, Moss Bros Group PLC, and HR Owen PLC. An MBE are not the only letters that Debbie can put after her name. She was awarded the Chartered Companion of the Chartered Institute of Personal Development, recognising outstanding and distinguished service to the people profession. And in July 2022, we were delighted to award Debbie the honorary degree Doctor of Business Administration here at Nottingham Trent University in recognition of her significant contribution to business and the public sector. Uh, thank you, Debbie, for returning to Nottingham Trent University. And this evening, given you're doing work related to the university, you are Dr. Debbie Hewitt. Thank you for coming back to deliver this evening's lecture, which we promised to be fascinating and I'm sure very reflective. So without further ado, a warm welcome to Debbie Hewitt, MBE, for our lecture. What tips would I give to myself about being a business leader, Debbie? Edward, thank you. Well, I think the first tip has to be that when you listen to something like that, it's not quite as polished in real life uh, as it sounds when someone describes what you've done, because what's missing, of course, is all the things that didn't quite go according to plan and some of the things that didn't quite happen the way that the textbooks say that they should happen. It's a very polished version that you've just heard. And what I want to do tonight is spend about 15 minutes telling you a little bit about why it wasn't maybe quite as polished 
as, as that introduction sounds. Some of my experiences, particularly what shaped me as a young person, um, a little bit about what shaped me as I've gone through my career, some of the lessons that I think I've learned along the way, and then a, a bit of a summary as to if you only took, take away one or, or two things from what I've said, hopefully to remind you of that. And then as much as I can questions, because I know having sat on that side that often what I have to say is not what you really want to hear, it's the questions that you, that you want to ask, so there'll be plenty of time for that too. So that's me, uh, my younger self. I think I was about five there. Uh, cropped hair is the first thing you probably notice. Um, when I was five years old, women were banned from playing football, uh, believe it or not. So I was brought up in a working class family, a family where nobody had been to university before. Um, a dad who was an amateur referee, um, and you know that's where my love and interest of football comes. I know some of you have said tonight you were here because of the interest in football, uh, but not just that. Um, I also had, quite unusual in those days, um, a mum who worked. So my mum was the main breadwinner, and it was quite unusual in those days. In fact, at school, I was seen as the weird one because, you know, at parents' evening, often my mum wouldn't be there, she'd be working, it would be my dad, and therefore I was always seen as this little bit of an oddity as to why was it that Debbie Moore, as my name was in those days, you know, her mum wasn't here at... Um, at parents' evening. So that probably says something about what began to shape me. I was not used to having, a, you know, a, a situation that where, you know, mum stayed at home and dad went to work. And that became traumatic um, a, a little, as I was a little older and my mum died. So you can imagine, I came from this family where um, working, working class backgrounds Main breadwinner was my mum, she died. My dad, who had no formal education, worked in a factory, had to do nights. So suddenly, as a young kid, there I was, you know, being looked after by my two-year-older sister uh, and with a much, much, much younger brother. Traumatic at the time. I, don't, I think it's only now, as I get older, I realise quite how traumatic it must have been. But somehow, I think that set of circumstances taught me that, you know, role models mean everything, and that's a blessing and a curse. Because one of the things, as you'll hear as I start to share, as I've developed, one of the big mistakes I made, and certainly for those women in the audience who might feel, you know, that I'm here to represent, you know, women in business, I could never understand why women had a problem about not getting on in business because of course I'd grown up in a situation where I'd had a mum that worked. That was normal to me. So when I heard women moaning about not being able to get on in business, I couldn't relate to it. It was, come on, get on with it. Yeah, this, is, that is, this is normal. Big, big, big lesson. And it was a session like this when I was about 36, 37. I'm sharing some of my experiences. I think I'd been on a listed board for four years. And I'm, and I'm saying, you know, it's all in our heads. Come on, women, you know, we can get there, we can get there. And a young girl sitting at the front, just like you're sitting there now, put her hand up and said, you know what? It might have been okay for you, but it's not for me. Let me tell you the experience of being an underrepresented minority in a business, a woman, in, working in the company that I'm working in and why it's difficult for me. My God, what a lesson that was for me, empathy. You, you know, to actually understand the, the journey that I've been on absolutely completely different to that young girl and um, for the first probably for one of the first times but right back down to you've got to walk in somebody else's shoes to understand the challenges that they have changed my whole attitude to women in business which i am sure we can talk about so death of a parent uh, i was the first to go to university i put at 28 there i didn't go first time around i went to work for Marks spencer as a management trainee in newark just down the road um, and then spent the rest of my time there, brilliant training, absolutely brilliant training, but with a bit of a chip on my shoulder, this is me being very candid and honest with you, and that I realised that everybody, the norm, was to get a degree. And although Marks and Spencer were giving me a fantastic training, I felt a little bit inadequate, is the honest truth. I felt as though everybody else around me, even though they may not have had the opportunities that I'd had, with Marks and Spencer, they'd all got degrees, and somehow I felt quite
quite inferior, not having got a degree. And that became a big push in my career as I got older. Uh, you know, there was sort of, sort of like a list of things that I needed to tick off. And in order to be a successful biz business leader, I had in my head, I had to get a degree. That was really, really important to me. So at 28, um, I got the opportunity to be sponsored to do um, an MBA, which was invaluable, actually, to, to the career that, uh, that I've taken. But, uh, but it did teach me that, you, you know, no matter what, it's what goes on in here that is the story and the script that you write. And once you start to understand and get in touch with what's going on in here, almost anything is achievable because you deal with your own, own thought and processes and the things that influence uh, the way and the way you think and the way you are. Um, I had bilateral detachments in my retinas along the way, so um, quite an interesting experience. You know, very got a, going great guns. Got my um, got my uh, MBA. Uh, you know, going on to the next job uh, and then going home one night. I was actually laughing with someone, believe it or not. Put my head down and suddenly lost my eyesight. Um, which as a young woman then, I was an absolute workaholic. It was, you know, all, work was all that mattered to me. No family, lived alone, work was everything. Suddenly to lose my eyesight in a role was just quite um, extraordinary. Um, and, you know, to be able to understand and empathise with what then happens when you have one of your five senses taken away and your life is planned out. God laughs at those that make plans you know, what, what happens next? And if that's of interest, we can talk about that too um, as, we, as, as I go on to some of the lessons learned. I was given a final written warning. Um, I made one holy mess when I moved from Marks & Spencer to another job. I moved for a company car. I'm ashamed to say that was the reason that I wanted to move. I couldn't wait to get a company car. That meant that I'd made it. Um, and I think it was a, a few hundred pounds more, a great sobering lesson of how important a good boss is. Uh, think very carefully, salary increase uh, isn't, isn't everything. I went to a job where I, where I traded a really good boss for a few hundred pounds and ended up in a, in a role that I really was not equipped to do. I should never have been given it in a month of Sundays um, and went on to make three or four very significant mistakes um, and ended up getting a final written warning. Um, the, uh, the letter still is actually in a frame at home to remind me from time to time you were that close to being fired. Um, you know, that classic moment, those of you who work in HR, would you like to be accompanied? You know, you think, blimey, you know, this is real. I'm in trouble. Um, but somebody took a risk on me at that point in time, which we'll, we'll come on to in a moment. Um, and then uh, feedback. Uh, you know, I was young. Um, I was inexperienced. I was northern. And the number of times that I was told that in my career, you're not going to get this job because you're too young, um, you've not got the experience. How do you get the experience if nobody's given you the experience? Any of you looking for your first management job, that will be the, the words that will cause you the most angst when people say, well, we can't give you a management role because you've not got experience in management. How on earth do you break that cycle? We can talk a little bit about that. Um, and I was once accused, yes, of being Northern. My accent probably has, I've worked on it a little bit, but I uh, was originally born in Yorkshire and had a very thick Yorkshire accent. And somebody here, Marks and Spencer, uh, said to me, you know, you're never going to get on unless you can actually change that accent. So that's the younger self that, um, and the experiences that, you know, when I go back and I think to myself, just preparing for tonight, you know, those are the various points in my life that have influenced who I am today and some of the lessons you're going to learn in, in, in a few moments. And here I am, my older self. One of my most proudest moments was getting my doctorate here. It was a phenomenal experience, particularly because I uh, went to school in Nottingham, knew the area very well. And in fact, I was just saying today how you know, I knew these buildings, but I knew them from the outside looking in. Um, never you know, never thought I would actually come inside uh, to, 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 the, to these sort of exalted buildings. And particularly not having done that first degree, this was where the posh people came. This is where the clever people came. It wasn't where someone like me came. So to be uh, in, inside Nottingham Trent University uh, getting a doctorate was probably as good as it got for me. Uh, my executive background, as you heard, uh, mainly in retail, Marks and Spencer, but also the car industry. Um, I've had... 18 non-executive roles um, in 10 different sectors. And, and one of the chips I talked to you about, you know, this chip about not, being, not having a degree, 
One of the other chips I got was when I had been very successful actually at RAC and getting to be the chief executive of that business, chief executive of a, business, a listed business that I'd run for eight years. You know, I was starting to do this sort of program, um, you know, ready for my next chief exec job. And I spent a year not being able to get a job because we'd sold the business. We sold the business to Aviva and I kept getting interviews to be a chief exec and then would be told, well, they really want somebody who's from a different sector. Um, and I'd go along for the interview and they'd tell me I was down to the last two and then they'd say they've gone with the other person. Um, they've gone with the other person who has got the experience in the sector and that was just so frustrating, disheartening and actually quite depressing for me having had eight years as a chief executive to suddenly be on the outside and told well actually no there isn't another job that looks like the RAC um, and certainly not another chief exec job that looks like the RAC uh, and was, was told three four times I think I got down to the last two and didn't get a job, didn't get the job. Um, which is where my uh, non-exec career then came in and I thought, well, if, you know, if I can't get a full-time job being a chief exec, doing what I love, well, then maybe it's time to go portfolio, portfolio, which was a relatively young age. And it was that chip again, a little bit, right, I'm going to prove to them that I can work in any sector. You know, I understand business, I can work in any sector. And then I was like a manic person. Anytime anybody, you know, there was an opportunity of a role in a different sector, I'll take it or I'll go for it because I wanted to prove probably to myself, um, articulated as the world, that actually I can work in any sector. And these are all themes as you start out in your career, those of you who are looking to build your careers, you know, all these myths that people tell you, um, and I'm gonna hopefully put, put to bed tonight. Um, I've worked in lots of different ownership structures. Um, so I've been in, um, Listed businesses, as I've mentioned, I've worked in private equity, I've worked in private businesses, um, I've worked in government, so very different ownership structures, and that's also a myth. Very often people say, oh, you're either, you're a listed business person or a private person or privately owned person, or you, you know, this is a private equity guy or girl. Uh, not so. Um, it is possible to work in different ownership structures. In fact, I would argue for me, um, that's what's kept my interest in business for so long. 40 years now, um, you know, so, so, um, so fresh because there's always something new to earn in those different, um, in those different ownership structures. Uh, my current portfolio is four chair roles as kindly described, um, and they are quite different. You know, at one end of the spectrum, Visa Europe is one of the world's largest financial institutions. Um, you, you know, it's huge, huge business, relatively small organization for the scale of what it turns over massively regulated. We're one of five systemic businesses as far as risk is concerned, financial risk um, for the UK government and in 17 other countries too that we preside over in Europe. Um, and, you, you know, something that everybody knows, normally the visa brands most people will know. The other end of the spectrum is white stuff, turns over about 120 million. Uh, uh, it's a small fashion retailer, lovely, perfectly formed business um, that, you know, has the, the travails of, of retail. Um, we've got about 120 stores around the UK and we're online too. If you're not a customer, I hope you will be by the time we go out here tonight. And then in the middle, of course, I have Compare the Market. Um, that's a business, it's a price comparison business, uh, a business that is in some sense, actually most people think of it as being in the insurance market, but we're actually we're in the consumer consumer market with a consumer's friend, with the most commercial version of, of which that you would probably find in terms of our role in the ecosystem. It's a very social purpose business too, um, certainly from, from my perspective. And then the Football Association, which of course um, is completely at the opposite end of the spectrum in terms of its profile uh, and in terms of the nature of its work. It's much more a social cause in some ways um, and it's just many, many lives being uh, part of the, the national game. Um, probably my most important role uh, is being mum uh, to my 14-year-old twins, Elian Wills, and of course husband to my uh, wife, to my long-suffering husband, Paul, who sees relatively little of me. Uh, and that's quite an important part of my older self, um, particularly as I have my children very, very late in life. Um, you know, they've been uh, quite a source of inspiration to me, but also a source of grounding to me. I think if they were listening to that introduction, they would say, 
um, you know, I'm not quite sure who came up with some of those uh, uh, sort of tributes because, um, you know, this is what she, uh, this is what you don't quite do as well. They are my fiercest critic, but also my most honest ones. And that's quite important to me too. So these are my lessons from, that's, that's the person that's standing before you. I think I should start also uh, by saying the story that I've just told, that's my view of that story. I'm sure if my sister was standing here, she'd tell the story slightly different. If my dad was standing here, he'd definitely tell the story quite different. Uh, if one of my bosses was here, they would tell the story quite different, possibly if one of my school teachers was here. But those are my versions of what my younger self uh, was shaped by and what my older self um, has morphed into. Um, and here I'm going to try and pull some of the themes from some of those milestones that I think have shaped who I am. And I want you to think about it as head and heart. You know, the sort of head, the, the sort of hard stuff in business. What are the hard lessons I've learned? Some of you, I'm sure, have come here to hear, particularly if you're doing a business program, you know, what are the, what are the kind of real concrete lessons you can take away as a leader? But then also some of the more emotional aspects to the job that I do as a business leader. So first and foremost, um, I learned the hard way that um, a business can make losses for many years, but it can only run out of cash once. Now, those of you who are doing accountancy will, will understand the significance of that. Those of you who are not financial will wonder, what the heck is she talking about? But there's an old adage in business that, you know, the, 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 the P&L, um, you know, the money that a business makes, is a load of lies, basically, that, that you, know, you know, that the accountants put together with a whole host of assumptions. You can make it say whatever you like. The truth of a business is its balance sheet, where its cash gets recorded. And one of the most significant lessons I learned when I took a business through administration, and I'm embarrassed to say, largely because I put too much debt in that business and didn't understand the consequence of understanding its cash flows. Massively hard lesson to learn, um, is that you can go on making losses for a very long time, but you can only run out of cash once. Any chief executive of a commercial organization is probably lesson number one two and probably three as well. Um, knowing the difference between opinion and fact, I was just talking to a couple of you up there who were talking about data and data analysis. So very often business leaders and particularly the not so good ones get confused between opinion and fact. They will make statements with such authority, normally because they feel they've got to be confident, where they'll make a statement which sounds just like the truth. Um, and actually there are very few things in business that are factual. More often, most often, it's a case of, it's my interpretation, it's my assumption, it's the way we're interpreting data. There are very few things that are truthful. And of course, um, facts are important. In fact, facts are essential to marshalling your thoughts. But most decisions, in my experience, this is my opinion, this is not fact, in my experience, most decisions that we make as business leaders are taking those facts, pulling them together, and then applying our own opinion. And I think it's really important as a business leader to know when it's your opinion that's driving you or when it's facts. And it's when you start to confuse yourself, you know, you're all the salesman, you know the answers. This is the truth. It's a great way for those of you who get into meetings where you think, you know, someone is sprouting forth to ask the question. It's a real showstopper. Is that your opinion or is that fact? And I can tell you there are a number of people, um, not so good leaders that I work with, who will swear blind that their opinion is, is fact and the truth. It's a great sign of a, of a, of a, of a good leader that, that, that they do and able to recognise um, themselves and catch themselves when they're, when they're presenting, uh, presenting their opinion as fact. Um, Change often takes longer than you think. So when I do my business plans in each of the businesses that I'm in, we do often a three to five year scenario. And we have all sorts of things in there. When I was running the RAC, we had driverless cars. That'd be a great example of, you know, even back then, wow, 2006, you know, we were saying, well, one day, you know, soon driverless cars are gonna be coming. And we spent, you know, each of the business plans that I did over those eight years had these weird and wonderful plans that said, well, when, you know, the driverless cars, will there be a role for RAC? And we spent ages, years, repeating this story. This is seismic change. And it always takes longer, in my experience, than you think for those big things to happen. But my goodness, when they happen, the implications are often an awful lot bigger. 
And I, you know, I think if I could live my life again and be a leader again, where I've made mistakes is where I've agonized over these hundred seismic changes that are going to happen. But then I don't really think through the significance of them. It'd be much better to recognize they're going to take longer, but it is going to be much bigger. And getting people around you who can help you think through uh, just the scale of, uh, and the nature of the change, the dreamers, those who can really help you empathize with what might happen if. Um, could it pass the Sunday Times test? This is a good head of one. Um, and a lot of people talk to me about my FA job. It's a very high profile role. We spend a lot of time being written about as an organization, the things that we've got wrong. The acid test, the question that I often uh, present to my colleagues is, you know, are we doing the right thing here? And they'll say, yeah, 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 definitely we're doing the right thing. Will it pass the Sunday Times test? When it's on the front page of the Sunday Times, will we say, even if people think we got it wrong, we know we got it right, or will we be embarrassed? And that's quite an important head test for me uh, as to whether we're making a decision correctly. And then culture each strategy for breakfast. It's a bit of a soft one, really, is the truth. You can have the best strategy in the world, but in any organization that you work in. And when you go and work out in organizations, those of you who work for very different organizations, it's the culture that ultimately, the execution of the strategy, that makes it successful or not. An average strategy. In fact, a below average strategy. I know that there might be some business professors in here that will shoot me for saying this, but in my opinion, an average strategy is fine if it's superbly executed with an amazing culture, because an amazing culture finds, finds the way through. If you've got an absolutely brilliant strategy, but a corrosive culture, you don't stand the Scoobies. It just isn't going to happen. So on to the more emotional stuff uh, now. Attitudes are contagious, is yours worth catching. Somebody once said that to me when I got a bit of arrogance, probably a lot of arrogance if I'm really honest. Um, it caught me by a bit by shock and surprise, but very, very true. Are you somebody in an organization uh, that people will really warm to because your attitude is one where everybody just loves being around you. You give energy, you don't drain energy. Very important. I'm going to come on to one a bit later on about keep good company. Really important to make sure that you are surrounding yourself with people who have good attitude. If they don't get the hell away from them, because it will be absolutely debilitating, and particularly as you face tough times in life. So do ask yourself from time to time about your own attitude too, not just those that you work with. Um, control the controllables. This is something that it's taken me 40 years to do, and with my kids, I still don't do it. I spend and have spent, and particularly as a chief exec, hours fretting about things that I have no control over. And one of the most best things about getting to be the ripe old age that I am now is I've gradually learned not to fret about the things I can't control. They will happen. I can't control them. And feel chilled and relaxed about that. Really, truly, um, it's one of the most stress busters. If you think about, you know, the times that you've... Um, you know, spent, and it's, it's this point which I think I, I skipped over, you know, the two link really, you, you know, how much, how much time I would spend agonizing about something, doing it brilliantly, and it didn't really matter. Because what happened to knock it off course was way out of my control. And those two things link quite considerably. Um, will it matter in six months time? This is a really good one. When you're fretting and you're stressing, a couple of you are taking A-levels, I, I hear out in the audience. Yeah, it will matter in six months' time, your A-levels. So when you're thinking and prioritizing about the things you can influence, you can influence. But other stuff that we, you know, spend a lot of time fretting over, will it really matter? You've just had a fallout with so-and-so, or so-and-so has just said something, or your idea hasn't been adopted. Will it really matter in six months' time? It's a great way to be able to disperse um, some, of that, some of that stress. Um, no, uh, and savor the perfect moments. Um, you know, I work with a lot of really interesting people, um, and particularly our lionesses, um, who one of them said to me, at the, you know, when, the day that, that we won the Euros, you know, I said, it, it, this must be, you know, your most magical moment, you know, ever. Um, and she said, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's brilliant. It's really, really good. It's really, really brilliant. I'm so excited, so excited. About six weeks later, I saw her and she was onto something else in one of her clubs. 
And you know, I said to her at the time, you, you know, smell the roses. This is just, just stand on the pitch and take it in because it, you, you know, this is a perfect moment. You're only allowed, by the way, a hundred perfect moments in life. This is the truth. This is not my opinion. No, it is my opinion. You're allowed a hundred perfect moments in life. If you do not find them and say, right, that's it. That's one of my hundred. That's one of my moments. And I'm going to celebrate it like it's one of my, one of my moments. You will have more than 100 moments in your life, but you'll never celebrate them. And she, six weeks later, said to me, you know what, it's really, I, you know, I'm just so busy on the journey. I've just forgotten, you know, and, I, and, and I, actually my biggest regret, she said to me, was that I didn't go around that pitch and just smell the success. I was too busy on to the next thing. So make sure that you um, look for your 100 perfect moments. And I'll tell you what, if you get to number 100 and you're 37, well, you know what? You might just be that one person that has 200 perfect moments. But really, really important, write them down. How many do you think you've had in your life so far that you can really say are those perfect moments and did you experience them as a perfect moment? Really, really important. And then um, the fish rots from the head. I kind of alluded to this about leaders, um, you know, and the leaders that you work with. Most organizations, if they're going off track, it's because the leadership isn't the right kind of leadership for that organization at that moment in time. And if you're thinking about working for a particular organization, make sure you net get to know those leaders. You know, leaders can create the culture, they can destroy the culture, they set the tone, they, they work on your development or not, they bring out the best in you or not. An organization is very much the reflection of its leadership. And it's so important that as you're thinking about your careers and going out there with your careers, that you understand the tone that's being set by the leadership of that organization. And then finally, um, keep good company. Um, and that's us two, twofold. Um, keep good company, the people, as I say, who create energy for you, the people who you, you, know, you spend time with, and no matter what, no matter how bad, no matter how low, they motivate you. Not in an insincere and sycophantic way, but also keep you on the straight too. Keep good company with the people who keep you honest, who tell you as it is. I mentioned the fact that I got a final written warning. The general manager that gave me that final written warning gave me some really honest, direct feedback, painful though it was, about the way I learned, about the fact that I wasn't prepared to accept, that I didn't really know how I handled it when I didn't know that, oh shit, excuse my French, that I used to use. He gave me really direct feedback absolutely direct between the eyes. I owe him my career, quite frankly. It's a real sliding doors moment, and it's keeping company with people that do that. Having people around you who tell you the truth, having people who tell you, you know, you're letting your opinion now dominate here. They're very, very important to any leader uh, in my experience in business. So those are just a few musings which hopefully resonate with some of the stories I told about my, my youth and also my, my older years in business. Um, but ultimately, if I could have only have come and given you um, one key message to take away, I think it is the fact that you know, success is not final. You keep going in your career. Um, it is not the final piece. It's important to celebrate it. It's important to have that perfect moment, but it's not final, and nor is failure fatal. It is what shapes us as a leader. I am the person that I am. The honest truth is the things that I got wrong. They have so driven uh, my learning, my development, my experience, and here I am, nearly 60, confident to talk about them, largely because I realized that if somebody had said that to me when I was 18, I probably wouldn't have to have gone through so much pain. And that sense of resilience, particularly those who are younger in the audience, I, I often get asked, what would I give my kids if I could give them one thing? From my experience as a business leader, it would be resilience. You'll have tough times, you really, truly will. But the ability to carry on, that's what really does count. And in any of the jobs, and particularly the ones that I'm in at the moment, there are good days. The highs are really high, but there are some really bad days where the lows are low. 
it's the resilience and the courage to carry on that I think ultimately give you the opportunity uh, to become a successful business leader. And if not a success in the role that you're doing, certainly the chance to go again, which is really, as a business leader, is all I've ever asked for. Thank you.